he sheds on our way, on our way, while we do his good will, oh, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey, we must trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in my Jesus, but to trust and obey. Two, not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt, nor a fear, not a sigh, nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. I must trust and obey, for there is no other way uh, to be happy in my Jesus, but to trust and obey. Three. Not a burden I bear, not a sorrow I share, but my toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief, nor a loss, oh, not a frown, nor a cross, oh, but it is blessed if I trust and obey. I must trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in my Jesus, but to trust and obey. For I can never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar I lay, yes, I lay down for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows. I for them who oh, will trust and obey. I must trust and obey for there is no other way that I'll be happy in my Jesus if I don't trust and obey. Five. Then in fellowship sweet, I will sit at his feet, or I'll walk by his side in the way, in the way, what he says I will do, yes, where he says I will go, I never fear, only trust and obey. I must trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in my Jesus but to trust and obey. I must trust and obey for there is no other way that I must be happy in my Jesus if I don't trust 
and obey. Can we just make that our prayer again tonight? Lord, help me to trust you. Help me to obey. It is only in my obedience that, Lord, um, I will grow in my sonship. I cannot be said to be your son when I disobey every instruction you give. I can be said to be an adopted son and when I constantly disobey you. Lord, I just beg again for our lives that you will cause us, O oh God, to trust you. You will cause us to obey you. We will trust you. We will obey you. For there is no other way to be truly happy as children of God. Lord, you are revealing this inheritance to us so that we can walk in it. Uh, but this inheritance will not be possible if we don't trust you. If we don't obey you, we will never enter into this inheritance. Lord, we have noted that this inheritance, even though it is invisible, we know it is real. The inheritance of being sons, being adopted sons and daughters, Lord, we know, even though, uh, Father, we, we confess that sincerely, if uh, you don't you don't help us. We will forfeit such beautiful uh, promises you have given to us. We will trust you. We will obey you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's have one or two people to quickly remind us uh, what was it that you personally took away from the class uh, the last time we met? What was your personal take? Uh, from the class uh, the last time we met. So if you are here and uh, you were blessed from the last class, um, you will just give us a short recap of what are the key issues that you took away from the class. Yes, can I have anyone um, give us your take? Anyone on the platform, just unmute, or you raise your hand the Zoom way. Uh, or we just unmute and then we'll take your comment. So quickly, we don't have all the time this evening, so we can go back to our, our teaching. Yes, we just want to remind ourselves because, you know, discipleship is not head knowledge. You know, in head knowledge, you learn, you write the exam, you forget it. <laughs> in discipleship, it is precept upon precept, layer upon layer one line upon another line. So we can't afford to forget what we were taught last week. Uh, if not, we will not be qualified for another information uh, that leads to transformation when there was nothing we took home. Uh, so that's why we, we seek to know what is it that has stayed with you in the last one week. So we do this not as a pastime, it's a part of our class. It's part of our learning. We want to trash to be sure that that which we got from our last encounter, we have not forgotten it. Because what we will be saying today uh, will be a continuum, a continuation of that which we have said uh, in the last class. Okay. So can I have one person who was here last class to say, this is what I learned. This is what I learned in the last class. Yes, it's part of our training. Anyone? Yes, uh, Jagade, are you wanting to speak or that's a mistake? Okay, Adibu Wale has quickly muted. So, yes, so who was here last uh, class? Um, let me not call Statutu, she has uh, prayed for us. Yes, Sister Tony. Uh, do you have something to say from last class? Yes. Yes. So please. I, okay. So one key thing that came to me from our uh, lesson last week is the fact that because I've been adopted, 
I must behave like a child of God wherever I am and in whatever situation I find myself. I'm not expected to behave the way other people are behaving. There is a way And as I'm learning from the Lord, as I'm learning from uh, in discipleship, I would know how I'm expected to behave as a child of God in every situation. And then because I'm, I'm, a, I'm an adopted child of God, I have the spirit of God. And in everything that I do, the Spirit of God must be the one something something that uh, spirit dead. I am not behaving the way that a child of God should be because a child of God must always be led by the Spirit of God in every situation. So that's what came to me okay. strongly right. last week. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Statoni. Yes, so she said there's because we are adopted. There is a way an adopted child should behave. A child in the house uh, behaves differently than a stranger. Uh, when a stranger comes, he sits in the parlor. When a child comes, he goes up to the house. So you're noting that um, we are adopted and uh, we must never forget that, uh, that we've been adopted and therefore we must continue our work with the Lord in such a way that um, uh, we do not allow uh, ourselves to still walk as if we have not been adopted. We have been adopted and uh, we must walk uh, in that, um, uh, you know, in that uh, regard. So in, in, in a way uh, to just do a summary, I would, um, let's read again the write up from that and then we we'll proceed uh, to today's class. He says, being children of the same father is not just by words of mouth, it is by birth. God made our inheritance authentic by giving us the spirit of adoption, the spirit of his son, Jesus Christ. And you know, it was Romans chapter eight that was saying that same spirit, that same spirit that was in Christ also is the same spirit that is in you. Is not short, is not uh, a lesser spirit, it is the same spirit. He removes the spirit of disobedience and timidity. That, that spirit that walked in Adam when he sinned, making him no longer to be bold, it made him to start hiding from God. That spirit is removed and the spirit of adoption comes into us whereby we have boldness to go into the presence of our father, crying, Abba, Father. And you know when we say, Abba, Father, because God also knows his children. And so you see it's two ways. We know our father, our father knows us. So when you cry, if a loving mother, a loving father says, yes, that's John's voice. He knows you. So every time we come crying, Abba, Father, he hears us. He knows us. We are not strangers to him. Uh, he knows who is calling. We are not outsiders. We are insiders. He says it opens to us all that belongs to God and makes it ours. God himself becomes our inheritance. That is glorious. It is part of God's great offer to us. Now, to balance that is to also know that when we say God has made us his children, he has adopted us, giving us the spirit of adoption. Now we are saying today that discipline is part of our inheritance. Discipline becomes part of our inheritance. Uh, as children of God, discipline is part of our inheritance. Now, I know that many times we don't like discipline. We like love, love, love. So for many of us, our definition of love is, is void of discipline. 
So we say, if you love me, don't discipline me. If you love me, talk nicely to me. When I'm wrong, just smile. When I do wrong, smile. Never correct, never rebook, never correct, never rebook. Just let me be. But we are noting that, no, actually, God demonstrates his love in discipline. Because a child who is not disciplined will become indisciplined. And an indisciplined child becomes useless. Nobody likes an indisciplined child. Nobody wants an indisciplined husband. You don't want your daughter to marry an indisciplined man. You don't want to employ an indisciplined staff. You don't want to employ to have an indisciplined friend. No. So God makes us disciplined. And he does that by disciplining us because we are his children. Uh, so uh, let's check again Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 5 to 8. Hebrews chapter 12, 5 to 8. If you are there, uh, you read for us. Hebrews chapter 12, 5 to 8. Who has that for us to read? Hebrews 12, 5 to 8. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 5 to 8. If you have it, you read for us. I'm reading King James Version. Yes. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 5. Yes. And ye have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children. Hmm. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, hmm. nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards hmm. and not sons. Verse 9. Furthermore, no, I think we'll we stop have... at 8. Okay, sir. We'll stop at 8. Thank you. So we are first noting again tonight that, um, and we have, and you have completely, uh, you know, and have you completely forgotten his word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. So this is a father speaking to a son. This is a father speaking to his daughter. My son, do not make light the Lord's discipline. Do not take it lightly. Don't uh, trivialize it. Don't handle it with levity. Don't despise it. Don't reject it. Don't, um, don't, don't, don't stand aloof of it. No. Don't take the Lord's discipline lightly. Why? He says you should not take the Lord's discipline lightly. Why did he say so? And do not lose heart when he rebooks you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. It is only those that love you that correct you. You know, sometimes you are looking at some children on the street. They are just misbehaving. But they are not your children. If you try to correct them and say, who, who, gave you, who, who gave you the audacity to talk to me? So sometimes you are just quiet. But imagine it was your son <laughs> that was sagging his trouser in the streets. You will not, if, by the time you call his name, Shegu, the next thing you will hear is a rebook, is a, is a, is a spanking in that is, is bomb bomb that removed that trouser. But you can't go around beating every young boy you see on the street sagging his trouser. So those of us who are his children, when you see God leaving other people's children, because actually, when a mother says, that's how I want my child to be. You know, a mother sent a, a, a letter to a school principal the other day. And she said that her son, um, her son was, was not staying in school. He was playing truancy. He was hardly in school. He will always be going out and all that. And this, um, and this, uh, what do you call it now? This uh, mother sent the letter to the principal 
and told him that, yes, I know what my son, uh, this true principal was trying to um, call the mother's attention to say, ah, uh, do you know what this your boy is doing? She said, yes, whatever he's doing is with my approval. No, so at that point, what can a principal do? This boy will come to school when he likes and the mother says, that's with my approval. So you discover that you, it puts the principal in a very difficult position. But imagine that the mother said, what? Bring that boy and kill him. You see, it will have given the principal a, the more effrontery, the more strength to deal with that boy. And that dealing will have made that boy's future correct. So only, only someone with a father receives proper discipline. And that's the problem when you see children that grow up from broken homes, children that grow up from single parents, is because they don't have the father figure who instills discipline. And so he says, if I don't discipline you, you become illegitimate, you become bastards, you become outcasts. So God needs to discipline his children because actually the discipline puts us in check. There is a lot of foolishness, you know, that the old nature has brought into our lives. And it is only the discipline of the Lord that removes some of those foolish old nature characters in us. And he says, you know, sometimes, how does God deal with a son that is proud? By disciplining him and ensuring that he eats the humble pie. And when he eats the humble pie, he becomes humble. So sometimes the father allows us to be disciplined. And I know that, you know, you will say, ah, no, now, if you love your child, no discipline, no. That's, uh, I don't know where we got that culture from, but discipline is part of the parental care. He says, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastises everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship, as discipline. <laughs> this is the one modern Christians don't like to hear. Endure what? Hardship? No. Me, I no go suffer. Hey. Me, no go beg for me. Right? Because the word hardship, he said, no, 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 no. But he said, endure hardship as, a, as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? What kind of child is that? There is an authority for himself. No. If you are a proper child that is under the roof of a father, then you know in many vows the father has rules and says wherever you are by 8 o'clock you are back home. That child cannot just go and, and say, oh, he's with friends and he's chatting till 11. A son with no father can afford to do that. Not one with a father. You know you will meet daddy at home. <laughs> Eight o'clock, you, you will tell daddy where you are coming from. So when a child knows that there is discipline, that daddy is at home, even though he doesn't want to come home, even though he wants to play some more, even though he wants to go for party, go for club, he wants to do X, Y, Z. He is refraining from doing that because he knows there will be hardship meted to him by his father if he breaks the rules. So discipline is part of our inheritance. It shows we have a father. When you sin and there is no repercussion, it means that you are helpless. But when you are being punished, it means that there is someone who is interested in your future. There's someone who is saying, no, you are more than this. And I will not allow you to destroy yourself. You are far more than this. I need to put you in check. So if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate not through sons and daughters at all. You are not sons of God because God disciplines his children. God disciplines his children. Are you a child of God? 
Are you a child of God? Then he disciplines his children. I know sometimes the Bible says it is better to go to the house of uh, mourning than the house of feasting. Because you see, when you are in the place of mourning, you think well. When some hardship happens to you, you sit down and evaluate. So many times we don't want hardship because we say, no, no, we want it rosy, rosy, rosy. No one who takes ice cream consistently can be healthy. So you can't say you don't want discipline. And every time God wants to discipline, you say it's the devil. You say it's the devil. And you are running away from it. There are things God will allow to your way so that you are disciplined, so that you are trained. Sometimes delay. Sometimes it looks like there are things you have prayed for and God is not releasing it. Because the only way to teach you patience is by introducing delay. You never learn patience in your life if God does not chasten you with delay. If God does not introduce the hardship of delay, you will never learn patience. You will never learn to trust God. You will never, if everything you want you have, you will be a proper spoiled child. That's why you see some children, when they want something and you don't give them immediately, they get so angry like one of my friend's son. He got so angry that his father didn't do what he wanted. He took a shoe and threw at the father's flat screen and broke it bagger, out of anger, a small boy of how many years? Because they didn't give him what he wants. He was protesting and broke the family's television. So you discover that many of us, because we have never learned discipline, any small delay, any small delay we want to backslide, any small hardship, things are not going the way it ought to be. If there is a small, uh, uh, financially, the school is going through some tough times. You want to quit. You want to quickly go and employ the unbeliever tactics. You want to employ all the things you said you have repented of. God knows, you see, he uses those things to test your love. When things are not going your way, when things are a bit tough, a bit slow, Salaries are difficult to come by. Do you quit the path of righteousness? No, son. Part of your inheritance is discipline so that you learn to be in check, so that you do not become wayward, so that you don't become, you don't keep satisfying your self interest, your self taste. Because part of the issue of discipline is to hinder you. You know, sometimes uh, you, there, will be, there will be a drink in the house. And your parents say, don't touch it. <sighs> and you know you feel like drinking it. They say, don't touch it. That's part of the discipline. To know that I can, but I should not. It's available, but not available. All that discipline, if you never get it, you will discover that such a child becomes a gluten. Anything his eye sees, his mouth must taste. That's a gluten. So if a child who has never been disciplined, anytime he cries, his parents give him what he wants, that child will grow to be a bastard. He will grow to give pain and tears to those parents as they grow older. You don't give a child everything he wants. You teach him patience. You teach him respect. You teach him self-denial. You teach him to say no to his loss, no to his passions, no to his desires, because that's the only way he will grow to become a legitimate, serious, useful child. And if God, God is simply saying, for you to become responsible and legitimate and responsible in my hands, I must use the, the inheritance of discipline to put you in check so that you do not, you do not become a wayward child. God must bring us, every one of us, to such an experience in the name of the Lord Jesus. We must come to a point where we understand that discipline is actually when God disciplines you. It shows that God loves you. 
because only those in discipline. It's like imagining a, a teacher that always is good in teaching, but never sets exam for his students. You know, a teacher that does not set exam, doesn't set test, you know how students will like him. Oh, students will say he's the best teacher in school. Ah, he's such a nice man. We like him. Eh? Just attend, get your marks. Every student in that school will like him. But you see, that man has only, the, has only mortgaged their future. Because it is the exams that shakes them to read what he that too they have not read before. It is exams that helps them to go back to their notes. It is the exam that helps them to sit up to get to be serious with their studies. So the discipline of exam can never be removed for a teacher that loves his students. Why don't you think that God will remove discipline in your own curriculum? We remove exam and test, sudden exam, sudden test from your curriculum. Will you become a good student? The answer is no. So discipline is part of our curriculum. May the Lord help us to stretch forth. And when it comes, receive it with joy. Can we now go to Psalm 23, verse 4? Psalm 23, verse 4. If you have it, uh, you can read for me. Psalm 23, verse 4. Yes, anyone there? Psalm 23, verse 4. No one has it? Okay, I'll read it from here. If none of Psalm you Psalm 23, Psalm yeah. 23, verse 4. Okay. Yeah. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm -hmm. I will fear no evil. Aha. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Okay. It says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It is your rod. Hey, I want you to take note. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Please, can I ask you, if you see a full animal with rod, is that rod, is holding, is it for comf comforting the animal? <laughs> no. But the psalmist knew that his rod that, chast that beats me takes me away from falling into the pit. Because if the shepherd does not beat that cow, he will soon stray away and he will have accident. Either a trailer will crush him, he will fall into a pit, he will fall into an ocean, he will, he will, his life will be ended. So the, 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 the sheep sees the master's rod as comfort, as comforting. Actually, why is it comforting? He is comforting because he delivers me from death. If the shepherd does not use his rod and his staff on me, I will be wayward and I will destroy myself. So he says that your strong, that rod you used to beat me with, that's actually what comforts me in righteousness. That's what assures me that you are still thinking about me. Because you don't use your rod on me if I am not going astray. The, a good shepherd does not use the rod on the sheep if the sheep is not heading astray. If the sheep is not going astray, a good shepherd does not use the rod on the sheep. He only uses that rod to, to keep the sheep in line, to ensure that that sheep does not destroy himself. So actually, the rod is a sign of comfort, is a sign of love, that if God loves you and does not want you to perish, then he uses his rod to comfort you, to correct you, to put you in shape. That's the comfort. Now, you see, for many of us, we actually think that comfort is when somebody pampers you and pampers you to destruction. No. It is when you, you, are, you discipline me so that I don't kill myself. 
when you discipline me so that I don't get lost, when you discipline me, shows you love me, shows you comfort me, shows you show, you know, a comfort is actually a sign of showing care. When you come to comfort the beauty, you only are saying, I care. And so when the psalmist says, your rod and your staff comfort me, you know what he's saying? He's saying your rod and your staff show that you care for me. It is because you comfort, you use that rod on me. That's how I know that you care for me. I know you care because of the rod. Because if you don't care, you will have allowed me in my sinful character to get lost. You will, allow, you will have allowed me to get lost in my sins. You will have allowed me to be derailed and my future will have been terminated. But because you care. So, you know, you can actually see another word for comfort is for a man to show care. When you comfort somebody, you care for him. <laughs> so when he uses his rod and his staff for me, that is God showing I care. I care enough that I don't want you to be lost. I care enough that you, I don't want you to terminate your life very young. I care enough to keep you in shape so that you become all that I had designed you to be. So I, want, I don't want you to terminate your life early. And the way I show care is to do what? Is to use the rod and the staff over your life. You know, very early, God helped me. And God helped me to define this. And I said to myself, whatever, whatever draws me nearer to God is good. And anything that takes me away from God is bad. That became my definition. That if anything makes me closer to God, whether it is pain, whether it is pleasure, whatever takes me away from God is bad. And so, because the psalmist understood this, this was the psalmist's interpretation. He says, your rod and your staff show that you care. Without applying your rod and staff, it shows you don't care. It shows you have not adopted me as son. It shows I'm not your own. It shows you are not taking interest about me. Whatever God will use to bring me to himself is good for me. That's good. So sometimes you discover hardship, adversity is what God uses to pull us to himself because he cares for you. Because for some of us, we are so stubborn that if God does not use a hard cane, you won't hear some cows are so stubborn that even one beating will not, uh, will not make them change direction. The shepherd must beat them like three or four times. Hard. Before the, his head will set. And then he will, he will return back to the path. So I will rather than the shepherd beats me. I will rather than he beats me. Than I kill myself on the express. I will rather that he beat me. And keep me in line than allow me to have my way and be terminated on express. I would rather he beat me to join the line, to stay in, with the flock, rather than be stray away and become a barbecue on the platform of my enemies. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Have you seen God's rod and God's staff as symbols of God's comfort? Or do you constantly fight his staff and fight his rod? Then you don't trust him. Then you have never accepted him as a true shepherd. 
He won't beat you if you are not straining. If there is no reason, he won't beat you. So every time you hear that rod on your back, means you have lost the path. Means you have strayed from the path. That should remind you, reset your brain to return back to your path and find out where did I miss it from being with the master. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Let me take the last scripture uh, before we now take our questions. Um, then we'll read Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5, uh, verses 17 and 18. If you are there, Job 5, 17 and 18. If you have that, uh, you can read for us. Job 5, 17 and 18. Um, Job 5. Yes. 17 to 18. Yes. Behold, happy is the man. Hmm. Whom God corrected, hmm. therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty, hmm. for he maketh sore and bindeth up, he wounded, and his hands make whole. Good. The NIV says, Blessed is the one whom God corrects. So you see, anyone that God corrects is a blessed man. I know you like inheritance. The inheritance is blessing to you. When you receive an inheritance, you say you have received blessing from your parents. And God says, my blessing is correction. That actually a father who corrects his son loves the son more than a father who gives a son a Mercedes Benz and allows him to kill himself. A father who takes the key away from that two-year-old child who wants to drive a new, brand new Mercedes Benz and he takes the key away from that boy, that father loves the boy. But the father who allows a two-year-old boy take the key and want to drive a new Mercedes Benz, that father does not love the boy. That father hates the boy. That's a suicide weapon he put in the hands of that innocent boy. So the Bible says, blessed, happy is the one whom God corrects. So whenever God corrects you, you are blessed. When Do you want to be blessed? Then allow the correction of God in your life. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds but he also binds up. He injures, but, he hands, uh, but his hands also heal. You know, you will not understand that scripture until you have had a wound and you go to this nurses. Then you will understand what that scripture is talking about. You see, when a wound is healing and it has created some layers and you take that wound to the hospital for dressing, the nurses will not just dress the, the cloth. No. They will scrape that cloth so that fresh blood will come out again. That is, that is a wound. But the reason the nurse is, is, is initiating that wound, wanting to see fresh blood, is so that you will heal properly. Actually, you see, when the nurse does not, when she doesn't cover it, she just, she just, she just binds it. You see, it will be less painful. When your a wound has clotted and you just put a bandage on it, you remove the old bandage, put a new bandage, that, that dressing will not be painful. But that wound will not heal well. So for the wound to heal well, what does the nurse do? A nurse that cares for you. She will scrape that that cloth, she will scrape it. Hey! And you know how painful that part is. Then she will put sometimes iodine in the fresh wound. Hey! The thing will go, it will ring bell in your brain. Very painful. But why is she doing that? She wants you to heal from the inside 
not to heal from the outside. So when she discovers you are healing from the outside, not from the inside, she scrapes the outside so that the inside will heal properly. That's what Job is talking about. He knows how to scrape every layer that is upon my life that will not allow me to grow properly. Every cancerous growth, he cuts it away. Every layer that hinders a proper growth, he removes it so that uh, as he applies the word of God, it will not be on the rock. Because you see the seed that fell on the rocky soil, uh, it looks as if it didn't die inside the ground. Uh, but actually the birds of the air came and ate it. So it was better than that seed was buried uh, in the ground so that that seed uh, will germinate and produce. The seed that fell on the ground, on the hard ground, never generated, never germinated, and it was easily eaten by the birds of the air. Do you want your life to be eaten by the birds of the air? Then you go for soft landing. But if you are wanting the father, to discipline you properly, to bring to you, bring you to a point where you are, you have learned obedience. You know, the Bible says, even for Jesus, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. That the Lord Jesus himself, the, the, the one that came from the Father, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. How do you think you, you will learn obedience if the father does not subject you to discipline? How? How? It is as you yield to his discipline that you learn obedience. A child that does, does what he likes will grow to respect no one. But a child that has learned to respect his father and the discipline of his parents that child will leave the house a respectful child. He will respect others. He will respect his wife. He will respect his children. He will respect his colleagues at work. He will respect everyone that comes his way. Why? He has learned obedience by the things he suffered. You know, for many of us, when we want to tell stories of our parents, oh, you say, my father, <laughs> if my father kills you, <laughs> you will know that, you know, when you hear daddy, when you have climbed a chair and they say, daddy, daddy, you will jump from that chair because God, God help you. That daddy meets you on that chair. You will tell him whether that is your new toy. And that discipline helped many of us to grow correctly, knowing to value the things that belong to others knowing how not to vandalize properties that are important to others. Why? Our parents dealt with us when we spoiled things. For a child that he doesn't know the value of anything, he breaks anything he wants to break and destroys anything he wants to destroy, that child will grow up not having values for discipline. And that child will destroy anything you put in his hands. May the Lord Bring us to this point of obedience in the name of the Lord Jesus. So let me read the write-up and then see if we have one question before we pray. It says, uh, discipline is part of our inheritance as children of God. Job recognized this and esteems it as a treasure, not, be a treasure not to be despised. David severally passed through it and calls it a comfort. Those who dodge the discipline of the father only prove that they are bastards. As you consider stretching forth your hands to receive God's great offer, it is necessary for you to understand that discipline is an important part of it. It is part of our glorious inheritance in Christ. May the Lord bring us to that point where we now understand that discipline, that the father disciplines those he loves. And if he loves you, he will discipline you so that you don't spoil, so that you don't destroy your future. He disciplines you. 
And that discipline makes you responsible, makes you reasonable, and makes you useful, both to yourself and to the society at large. Okay, let me stop here and find out if there's anyone with a question or a contribution you want to add to all we have said uh, before we go to the place of prayer. Anyone wanting to ask a question or um, you want to ask a question or you want to uh, throw in a light uh, to further help us explain this properly. Yes, uh, Sister Tinu, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for the explanation, sir. So my question is that, how do I know the difference between God's discipline and the enemy's oppression? Hmm. Aha. Yes, so she said, how do I know the difference between when the devil disciplines me and when God is the one disciplining me? Hey, very interesting. Actually, how do you know that you are outside the house? is when rain begins to beat you. So actually the Bible says my life is hid in Christ and Christ is hid in God. So whenever I begin to go through pain, or whether it's the devil, whether it's the father, it makes no difference. Because if it is the devil that attacks me, what the devil has only told me is that I'm outside my father's comfort zone. It, it only tells me that I have strayed away from the cover of my father's attack. So every attack of the devil, actually to a Christian is a blessing. <laughs> Can I tell you the truth? That every time the devil attacks you, he has only blessed you. Because if the devil attacks you, Number one, it tells you that you have left your father's cover. So what should I do? Fight the devil? No. I will run back to my father's cover and say, Daddy, I'm sorry. I didn't know that I left cover. Have mercy on me. Take me in. Hide me under your bosom. Rock of ages. Clear for me. Let me come in and remain safe in you. So what has the attack of the devil done? It has saved my soul from being lost in hell. So that attack of the devil is good. Because I told you anything that takes me closer to God is good. Whether it's, pun it's discipline from the father or an attack from the devil, whichever one that draws me nearer to God is good. Anything that takes me away from the father is bad. So if it is the devil that attacks me, that will send me back to the father's presence, then that attack is good. If it is the father chastising me, my father's discipline, he comf his comfort. It only shows he cares. So every time I find myself in a, you know, in a difficult situation, it is only asking me to run to the father. When I now find my place secured in the father, aha, then I will say, Satan, throw your arrows again. Aha, now I am undercover. My life is now hid in Christ, and Christ is hid in God. So Satan, throw your weapon. And then I will now begin to make deal with him, because now I am now seated with Christ, far above principalities and powers. So I take my position, and I say, hey, hey, hey stop that nonsense. Why? Because I have now located my place in the Father. From there, I will, I will punish him because the Bible says that you will not be able to punish the devil's disobedience until your own obedience is complete. How do you want to punish the devil's disobedience when you are strayed away from your father's cover? So first I will run back to my father's cover. And once I've secured my position in that, aha, then I will say, you, you, you wicked spirit, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Aha. Then the devil knows that this time around, I have located my position. He has only helped me. So actually, he's not my enemy. He has helped me to relocate myself in my father. Yes. Any other question? Is that clear? 
Any question? Before we go to the place of prayer. Yes. If there is no uh, question, we will go to the place of prayer. Yes, Sister Ifebo, you want to ask a question? Or make a No, sir, not. Yes, to make a contribution, sir. Please go ahead, ma'am. Yes, I learned a lot this evening, mm. especially on the fact that um, the actual meaning of comfort, mm. the place of his rod and his staff, mm. God comforting me with discipline is a big revelation tonight. And then, um, you know, discipline as part of the family opened my eyes to so many things. In the first place, when you were talking, I remember that the Bible said that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. So I quickly ran my mind over the life that Jesus lived. And then I thought about the suffering on the cross that he went through. And then I said, well, before I joined this family of God, before I queued up behind Jesus, when they said he's the firstborn among men, something should have told me that discipline is part of this family. Mm. Something should have told me that it is not all bread and butter here. If the firstborn in this family went through such gruesome death, the father did not say, oh, because his word made flesh. I will just say it from heaven, you are all saved and everyone is saved because I don't want any scratch on his body. If Jesus could have gone through all of that, despite the fact that his father has the power, even as Jesus said, do you think that I won't just issue a command and legions of angels will come down and wipe you out? But God chose that way. Then something originally will just let me know that if it is this family, this same family where I'm adopted into, I think everything you said tonight is part of it. It is part of the family heritage. And then I, when you sang, me, I know go suffer, then something crossed my mind. It don't know me that sometimes, even when we have our little children, especially when my, my children are a bit grown now, when they were smaller, sometimes there may be chocolate, candy, bread, butter, so many things available. And I would just say, and they are crying, I would just say, you are enough, you are not eating. And it's not that that thing is lacking, but something tells me in my mind that you can't be feeding them like that. And they really need that thing and they are crying and I have reason. There is something that justifies my no in my heart. And then I'll check my heart. The thing that make me say no is, if you keep giving him like this, how will he survive out there? If he keep collecting any time, how will he cope when somebody don't? So let me deny him so that he will know that, you know, where I came from in the East, they will say that you will know that Hamatan is cold, you know? <laughs> so I now realize that when, we, when God refused to give us something part-time, it is not that there is lack in my father's house. Mm -hmm. It's so I shouldn't be agitated though, because I thought about it that when I have a lot of things on the dining or in the refrigerator and I say, my children, don't touch it too. If they know that it is not that there is lack in this house, they are not supposed to be agitated. But now I remember that they used to be very agitated, crying. And that's exactly what I'm doing though, to God. So if I know that it's not that there is lack actually in this family, but God say, it's not every time you want to change a car, you change it. It's not every time you want to get a cloth, you get it. It's not every time you want this, you have it. Because it's preparing me for something bigger. And then I realized that discipline may be different because it depends on who is actually grooming me to be. I learned a whole lot this evening. And my prayer is that when the discipline actually comes, that I will remember again all that was said tonight and not be agitated, knowing that they, it's not that there's lack in my father's house. It's not that God can't do all these things, but he's doing what is best for me at the time. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. You know, I like the fact that she said he's doing it for my best. That's what is best for me. I was, re I just, as she, as she was talking, I remembered the children of Israel. <laughs> you see, God gave them um, meat every day on the day before the sabbath he will give them for two days for that day and the sabbath day and it will not spoil 
But any other day that is not Sabbath day, that you take more than you need by morning, it will become worms in your hands. So he, you see, even when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, I don't know whether you took note of the way he taught us to pray. He didn't say, give us this days, our daily bread. Give us this day, this day. And she said, it is not because there is lack in heaven. No, that's, it's not, that's not why he's living like that. No, it's because he wants you to be trained. You are a soldier. And a soldier without discipline is a civilian. He can't win any battle. He wants you to be a soldier. And to be a soldier, you must be trained to starve in the bush. If not, you will quickly chicken out and, and sell off to the enemy. So a soldier knows that sometimes he will suffer. Sometimes he is taken to the bush. It's not because there is war. You prepare uh, for war time in peace time. And so you go to the bush and do drills as if it was war time. And so when the father disciplines us, he disciplines us so that when we are tempted, we will not fall into that temptation. Because James chapter one told us that every man is drawn into to sin by his lusts. And one of the things that discipline does is to remove lust from you so that you believe and trust in the Father more than you actually trust in your lust. And as we uh, begin to uh, come before the Father uh, in prayer, we need to begin to know that honestly, the Father genuinely cares for us. He cares for you. He cares for me. Whatever he does, it is for your interest. It is for my interest. May that be our, may we trust him and obey him. That when we see such things, we say, yes, Lord, I know you are thinking about me. At the end of the day, Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And when he did that, God gave him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, Every knee must bow. Why? He endured affliction. He didn't enjoy it. He didn't enjoy it. He endured it. Discipline is endured. But after it has been endured, it will produce a fruit of righteousness. Sister, brother, will you endure the training of the Lord in discipleship? Will you endure and stay there and say, I will not go out? I will stay here until Christ is formed in me. Or will you say, if there's a small challenge, I, I'm getting out, I check out. No, that must never be your portion in the name of Jesus. I will call our sister um, who will be guiding us to pray. It's time to commit and ask the Lord for grace that the Lord will grant us grace to pray. Let's pray. I like us to begin yes. to appreciate the Lord. Let's thank our Father, our Most High God, for what we have heard tonight. I just want you, with a grateful heart, wherever you are this evening, appreciate God for loving you, even in discipline. Every single pain, every single discomfort, Everything that the Lord has put in place to draw you and I nearer, I want you to begin to appreciate. That same thing that we have murmured about, that same situation that we are troubled about, that same thing that had made us think differently, as if God is far away. Now we have seen it today from a different light. I just want you to open your hearts and praises. Begin to bless God. Thank God. Appreciate God for making you part and parcel of this family. Now we have heard that discipline is part of the heritage of this home. 
Can we appreciate God? Father, thank you. E kanta li bra mo sonto li kanta li mo sintelia. E kanta li bra mo sinteli kanta li mo sonto li ma antalia. E kanta li mo sonto li bra mo sinteli kanta li mo sonto lea. Father, we appreciate you, Lord. We thank you. We give you all glory, all honor, all adoration. Ah, Father, we appreciate your holy name. We thank you, mighty Jehovah. We thank you, our Father, who has loved us this much. Oh, your rod and your staff has been working ever since, and we knew it not. Thank you, mighty Father. Thank you for our crawling process, for all the times we fell down and got up. Thank you for learning to walk. Thank you for holding our hands when we learned to run. Thank you for our childhood days in this family. Thank you for our period of growing up in this household of God. Father, we appreciate you for everything. You are a marvelous God. You are a glorious God. We appreciate you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to ask for grace not to jump out of incubation. When the mother hen is sitting upon her eggs, I am sure that it may not be comfortable for those eggs. Just ask for grace to remain here. Grace to go through all that God wants you to go through. To jump out is very dangerous because it means we are bastards. I don't know your own discipline pattern. It's quite different from what God is taking me through. I just want you to ask for grace. Oh, grace, Lord. Grace, your grace alone is all we ask for, Lord. Oh, grace, thy grace alone is all I plead for, Lord. Grace to serve the right, Lord, and grace to love you more. Father, grace, grace, ask for grace not to jump out of incubation, grace to stay put, grace to undergo this process. This is the prize of adoption, the prize of sonship. Hey, something should have told us that in this family of God, there is no pampering to the extent that worms will be coming out of our body. God wants children that are well made, purified by fire. He said, when you go through fire, not if, if we go, when you go through the fire, we go with you. God wants sons and daughters that will stand the heat. Those that can stand the heat of discipline, people that he can make and be able to present us. And if we are not made, God can never thrust anything serious into our hands. Oh, since discipline is part of this making, Father, grant us grace. Grace, O oh Lord. Grace, Father, not to jump out. Grace, not to abort it in the name of Jesus. Grace, not to say no. Grace, not to wriggle our necks out of your hands. Father, help me to stay here. Help me to sit right here where you want me to be made. Grace to go through the refiner's fire and come out purified. Grace not to say, ah, the heat is too much. Me, I no go suffer. Father, please equip our hearts. Equip our hearts, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Equip our hearts, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, the strength, the grace equipment, all that we will need to grow in this way of our Father. Please grant us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. I want us to pray. You know, when our brother was talking, he, he spoke about God not granting us everything we want at once. You know, give us this day our daily bread. Now, that takes me to the prayer point called contentment. I realize that if we are not contented with this day's provision, oh, we will always be clamoring for what is for next year, what is for next week, and that will bring us to ingratitude, contentment, contentment. When the Father say, take this for this day, that my heart will rejoice, that I will not be careful for tomorrow, that I will with thanksgiving accept what he has provided for this day, for this day, for this time, so that we will not be encumbered with load of many cares. Oh, well, how will I pay the staff next year? How will I pay next month? Oh, how will I do this project? Whatever the Lord provides for now, Father, grant us contentment, contentment, Oh, Father, that we will be contented, a heart very thankful of the ones 
whatever you have done. Let us understand that you are doing it for our best interest. One step at a time. You are the one with the blueprint. We has, there's no need struggling to have the blueprint. Oh, to know what is available for tomorrow. What is available for next tomorrow. That we ask for a heart of contentment. A heart that is willing to go by time as God provides. A heart that is willing to go according to God's demands and dictate for each time and part time in the name of Jesus. Some of us are not comfortable with what God has provided. Some of us, oh, we just want to build the next thing now. We just want the project to finish right now. But God is saying, no, it is bit by bit. And he has his reasons for it. And we remember in the scriptures, when the Lord said that he's driving the beast away, he said, if, uh, if he allowed the children of Israel to even conquer all their enemies in one day, he said, the beast will come in. The beast of the wilderness will come in and devour them. Ah, God is very wise. Can we appreciate God? Let's pray. Father, contentment. Whatever you have provided part time, whatever victory the Lord has given me part time, Father, I open my spiritual eyes that I may be delivered from greed, struggling for tomorrow. What is not yet? Father, help us with it. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. I want us to pray one more prayer point. I want us to pray that we will become channel of discipline for our teachers and our children. It dawned on me that if God is bringing this discipline and we are also pampering those that we are supposed to discipline, those that we are supposed to mold well, oh, maybe because you don't want to lose a particular teacher, so we keep the truth from them. Maybe because we don't want a, a child to, 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 for parents to change a child's school, oh, so we pamper them. Let's ask the Lord, Father, as I am disciplined, I am a leader, help me, Lord, to discipline those under me. In the name, it's a heritage. As I am being blessed, I, the, our brother said that discipline is God's blessing. Because some of us think that when we when we have inherited things from our parents, oh, they have blessed us. He said, God say, my own, my own blessing is discipline. Father, that as you are blessing us as leaders, we should not allow pampering. We should not pamper and spoil those that God has brought under our care. We should be able to discipline in love. We should be able to re rebuke in love. We should be able to address issues in love in the name of Jesus. Grace to groom others. Grace to discipline. Grace to mold them according to God's pattern and God's dictate and God's interest for their own lives as well. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh Lord, as we receive discipline from your hand, as leaders, we pray that you give us the boldness, the confidence, the wisdom to bless those that are under us. Because today we have learned that discipline is blessing. Father, that we will not waste the lives we have committed into our hands. We will not pamper our children in our schools to the extent that, oh, we just, even some of us, we just do anyhow so that the children can be comfortable. They will say, I like this school. A, a parent came to challenge me one certain time. My son say, your party is boring. I say, why? He said, because he did not play happening music. You know, and some of us, something as small as that could tempt us to play the wrong music so that they will say the party was hot. Father, give us the grace not to do, handle the people that are under us with, 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 with anyhow attitude that will be able to bring discipline, will be able to bring correction and rebuke and correct molding so that as we are being helped by God, we will also help others in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Our Father and our Most High God, we appreciate you this evening. Father, we thank you with a heart full of thanksgiving. Father, we adore you, we reverence you. We have been shown tonight that discipline is part of this family and you have adopted us and we are right here. Oh Lord, we pray the grace to accept discipline, the grace not to jump out of incubation, the grace to be contented with whatever you release by time. Father, please grant us in the name of Jesus. Our brother told us that sometimes this lack is to test our love for God. May we not disappoint you. May the pleasures of this life and the things we, we, we previously thought are comfort not draw us out of Father's love. 
in the name of Jesus. And even when the enemy brings any form of attack, Father, hurry our steps back to the rock of ages so that we may be well seated enough to rebuke the disobedience of Satan. Thank you, our Father and our Most High God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen.